Thank you, Zoe. What a sweet introduction. Um, and actually, I realized that that first slide didn't really capture the title that we were going for today, which is the multisensory contributions to posture and its impact on social emotional development. Um, and importantly, postural control is a multifaceted system. It's dependent on the integration of numerous sensory and motor contributions. And so we're going to focus on constructs such as posture and its connection to function, its relevance to practice. And a lot of the clinical examples come from research with autistic individuals, but really are relevant to a wide range of diagnostic groups. So my hope is at the end that we'll see how posture has an immense impact on social emotional development and the emergence of communication abilities. Um, before we progress slides, um, just to understand that these terms are really the, the areas that uh, represent the complex interaction of multisensory inputs um, and aspects of motor function that are foundational to posture, which include tone, alignment, balance, core stability. Next slide. So what is posture? Simply stated, postural control is the achievement, maintenance, or regulation of balance during any static posture or dynamic activity for regulation of stability and orientation in space. The interaction of the individual with the task and the environment are crucial to the development of postural control. So what contributes to pastoral control? Well, there is in fact a reciprocal relationship between pastoral control and tone, as I said before, alignment, balance, and stability. The prerequisites of pastoral control include the foundation of tone that supports sustained activation of the core muscles and our endurance, a foundation of pastoral alignment that makes movement optimally efficient and supports the goal of being able to maintain one center of mass over the base of support. The postural control system has two primary functions. First, to build up posture against gravity and ensure that balance is maintained. But secondly, to fix the orientation and position of the body segments that serve as a reference for perception and action with respect to the external world. So this dual function is based on several components. It's based on these reference values that I was just talking about, which is the orientation of our body segments, our position uh, relative to the center of gravity that become our internal representation of the body or that postural body schema. It's also based on multisensory inputs that regulate our orientation and stabilization of the body segments and a flexible postural system or anticipation for balance recovery after disturbance and stabilization during voluntary movements. Next slide. So why are we so concerned about posture? Because the outcome of postural control is the ability to sustain muscle activation in order to meet the demands of daily life activities. Posture impacts motor performance and the acquisition of motor skills. And the motor performance, we, the supposition for today um, that we're going to go through is that this motor performance impacts the development of social and communication abilities. Posture supports everything that we do. It provides the core stability that's necessary for daily life activities. It supports our motor abilities so that individuals, and here we're talking about children, can engage in playground activities, socialize with their peers. And it, it, even as we age, posture impacts our ability to engage in, in physical activity, to exercise, and it's critical to self-regulation preventing obesity, and contributes to overall health and wellness. 
posture is critical for balance. It's central to endurance and it impacts autonomic functions as well, which include respiration and swallowing. So what does the literature say about posture and movement? Well, motor impairments have been reported in autism since as early as the 1990s. Rappin in 1996 found 25% of a cohort of children had hypotonia. Cone Raz et al. reported hypotonia, a preponderance of hypotonia in individuals with autism as well. And adding to that, Ming and colleagues in 2007 reported um, about 51% of their sample of children and adolescents on the spectrum had hypotonia. And this percentage was greater in the younger children as well, those aged to two, from two to six years of age. 19% were toe walkers and 9% had some kind of gross motor delay. The current thinking is um, emphasizes the prevalence of motor dysfunction and postural challenges um, and has grown over the last 10 years in terms of research and recognition of the underlying neurobiological disruptions. In fact, some researchers actually consider the motor domain to be a cardinal feature of autism because of the association between the motor deficits and social communication abilities. The finding being that children with weaker motor skills have greater social communication deficits. We know that there are a multitude of systems that are involved that need to be explored, which underlie postural control and motor functioning, such as the musculoskeletal components, the acquisition of neuromuscular synergies, the primary sensory domains involved in balance, the activation of anticipatory mechanisms involved in movement, adaptive mechanisms used by the individual to respond to the ever-changing internal and external environment, as well as our internal representation of the outside world in relationship to our internal self and the impact that all of uh, that context and, and uh, task have on performance. Some literature makes a distinction between two levels of postural control. One that sets the distribution of tonic muscle activity and the other that adjusts to the changes in the internal and external environment um, on an ongoing basis. And of course, both are inherently interrelated and have distinct neuromuscular underpinnings. Factors contributing to challenges in postural control might include weaknesses in brain mechanisms. Since postural control occurs in response to active movement, in fact, a lack of motor experience might be detrimental to the development of postural control. Other factors, of course, include the integration of sensory information, particularly from proprioceptive and vestibular mechanisms, which are more unconsciously supportive of mature postural control. And when the cognitive task or environmental demands are high, postural control may also be compromised due to the allocation of attentional resources, um, the ability to engage in appropriate movement synergies and problem solving strategies tends to decrease. Interestingly, another piece of information that has emerged is that the um, social expectations um, that cause anxiety can impact one's sense of self, one's sense of self-confidence, and is sometimes reflected in the ability to maintain upright postural control. In a, um, there have been two paths that have actually um, been proposed to uh, that anxiety affects relative to postural control. One is of course activity avoidance. Um, so the anxiety removes the individual from the activities that foster that postural control. But there's also the 
hypothesis that anxiety can alter the basic sensory processes um, that affect the manner in which sensory input is in integrated and used to regulate balance. So there appears to be a really complex mechanism between the interaction of anxiety, balance, and the development of gross motor skills. As we'll see in progressing through the slides, the impact of these motor difficulties contributes to reduced participation with peers during play and sports, hampering social interaction and social development. Fournier and colleagues found in a meta-analysis of 51 studies that immature postural control was documented as an underlying impairment with resultant motor coordination issues in individuals on the autism spectrum, with decreased movement preparation and planning, impaired upper extremity function, and problems with gait and balance. Next slide. So the, the question is, should posture be considered part of the core sy symptoms of autism? Not sure we're fully ready to answer that question, but we do have some preliminary data that might support. Um, some consider posture as an early diagnostic mat marker. Um, we know that deficits in infancy persist into childhood, and there's data that suggests that the impairment in motor functions may be present before the social interaction problems manifest. Um, so does decreased postural control and deficits in motor function exacerbate the core symptoms or limit social interaction? So let's take a look at what we know about early motor development and how it affects other aspects of development. The studies we're going to look at now suggest the importance of the role of motor behavior on cognition, language, and social development. It's well documented, really. Wait, did we go? Can you go back? Sorry. <laughs> um, I have a few comments on this one actually that aren't written, but it's well documented that early motor development is related to concurrent learning and later functioning. Milestones such as crawling and walking facilitate the infant's perceptual, cognitive, and social emotional development. For example, Compost et al showed that infants with crawling experience are more likely than pre-crawling infants to show social referencing, reciprocal social interactions, and emotional reactions of either anger and happiness, even after controlling for age. Infants with locomotor experience demonstrate more wariness of heights, better perception of depth and distance, as well as better spatial performance. Thus, increased mobility provides a broad range of experiences that enrich the environment available to the learning system. And each new motor accomplishment further expands the set of multimodal experiences for the infant, creating a strong link between motor development, cognitive, and social development. So foundational to early development, of course, is spontaneous movement exploration of the infant and imitative capacities that build awareness of the self, the environment, and represents an integration of that social, cognitive, and motor components that we've been talking about. Early postural control is foundational to this self-exploration as well as to the development of hand function and hand skills that support learning and meaning making that comes from one's interaction with people and objects in the, in the world. So as De Groot said in 2000, an abnormality in postural control disrupts the development of adequate motor behavior and sensory motor interaction. Which which can result in faulty perception action cycles, thus influencing later social and cognitive development. 
So increasingly, researchers are suggesting that motor delays may appear across many clinical disorders before the full-blown manifestations are actually realized. And the implication of aberrations in underlying brain networks is increasingly being explored. And it's been reported, of course, that these motor deficits per persist from infancy to childhood as well as to adults. The presence of poor postural stability or poor anticipatory postural adjustments can impact motor planning, can, imp can produce poor grading of movement. There may be difficulty with the accuracy and quality of imitation as well as gait abnormalities and deficits in fine and gross motor abilities, um, which depend on this core stability and the use of subtle postural adjustment reactions. Much of the research comes from retrospective studies um, and many of those studies have been used for the early detection of motor problems through uh, videotape and of home uh, ana videotape analysis of home movies. Um, these retrospective studies identify motor behaviors such as showing, pointing, orienting to one's name, the use of gestures, all may be delayed in children who receive a later autism diagnosis. Additionally, atypical movement patterns have been suggested as an indicator of the integrity of the infant's nervous system. Such atypical movements include descriptions of the quality and complexity of movement patterns used, as well as just general descriptions of motor clumsiness or lack of coordination. Um, when identified retrospectively, the infants who later received a diagnosis of autism could be distinguished from those children who did not receive a diagnosis. There's also a growing number of prospective studies of motor delays that suggest that early motor milestones such as babbling and postural stability are impaired in this group of high risk infants, infants who are at risk for autism, likely due to having a sibling um, with, with autism as well. In addition, a lack of mature object manipulation and grasping has also been noted. Other um, prospective studies show gross motor delays at 14 months of age in children who are later diagnosed on the autism spectrum, reduced motor activity at six months of age in a subset of high risk infants that are later that were later diagnosed um, on the autism spectrum, as well as visual impairments such as declining gaze to eyes and atypical visual orienting. Hypotonia was identified in 63% of young children, two to six years of age, and head lag on pull to sit has been associated with a later autism diagnosis. For example, in a study by uh, Flanagan and colleagues um, who looked at infants at high risk who had an older sibling on the spectrum, they found that in this high risk group, um, they were more frequently observed to have a head lag at six months of age and concluded that this finding might be an early indicator of a neurodevelopmental disruption. Head lag was an indicator of low muscle tone, poor postural stability, and impaired integration of sensory information um, and poor activation of anticipatory postural activity. So let's talk about the association between posture and motor impairment in later stages of development. Mamari found features of early impairments that persisted into childhood included things like decreased static and dynamic postural stability, decreased functional balance, and difficulty with motor performance. 
In fact, individuals on the autism um, spectrum appear to have a different kind of trajectory um, of the development of postural control compared to neurotypical children who tend to um, exhibit a resurgence in motor development at the age of five years. But actually in autism, this improvement may not be observed until the child's um, almost 12 years of age. Um, and in fact, it, in many individuals, it does not really reach that adult level. Additional contributing factors, of course, are challenges in the ability to integrate sensory inputs from somatosensory, vestibular, um, and visual domains, particularly when the input from tactile and proprioception are distorted. Children are ten, on the autism spectrum, and I think in general, tend to rely on visual input when those other sensory domains are weakened. Um, as their primary means to maintain postural control. And as I indicated before, perceptual and cognitive demands of tasks can alter one's postural control. Um, and clearly there are, are, the literature suggests there are multiple mechanisms may be responsible for this postural insufficiency. And in fact, in a um, more recent meta-analysis by Lim et al. in 2017, um, they delineated that the sensory um, impairments that are negatively impacting um, postural control are well supported by multiple studies. And that this integration of sensory information, which is so familiar to us, is critical to eliciting those appropriate balanced motor responses, um, which seem to be hampered in um, autism, um, in individuals with autism. Mamari further suggests that um, balance regulation is not purely reflex driven, but relies on higher cortical centers that are involved, such as the basal ganglia, the cerebellum the motor cortex, the vestibular cortex, and the brainstem. The cerebellum and the basal ganglia through connections with the brainstem, thalamus, and hypothalamus have been implicated. And they describe the cerebellum as regulating the cognitive and automatic processing of posture and gait control by acting on the cerebral cortex via the thalamocortical projections onto the brainstem as important underlying mechanisms, um, as well as implicating decreased activation of the supplementary motor areas and relatively greater activation in the prefrontal cortex. There's evidence of diffused, um, decreased connectivity across motor ex execution networks such as cortical and subcortical areas, the motor cortex, as well as previously mentioned, the cerebellum, the thalamus, and the supplementary motor areas. However, when considering the posture and motor findings, differential diagnosis is critical. Postural deficits clearly may be due to other factors than autism. Um, in fact, we know that there are a whole host of postural problems that are associated with sensory integration challenges, um, available attention resources, and basic abilities to function within the multisensory environment. So let's discuss some of the functional implications. As I suggested in the beginning um, of this presentation, motor impairments can lead to lower participation in physical activities, games, and sports that hampers one's motor experiences and decreases the learning opportunities, which may limit the ability to improve or grow one's postural control system.
data is available for the association between motor performance and social interaction and communication comes from a variety of sources. One study in particular by McDonald and colleagues showed that 79% of 10 to 14 year olds had motor skill deficits and associated postural control challenges. The authors suggest that the, in, these individuals had less practice in social communication due to their motor deficits and re reduced participation in typical physical play activity like at the schoolyard or during recess. A further impact on communication abilities can be seen in how postural deficits affect the emergence of nonverbal communication and the use of gestures. Gestures require control of the body movement, the arms and the hands and facial expressions um, that develop from a foundation of postural control. Posture is a component of actually of self-validation the research shows that mood and self-confidence are associated with the way we hold our body. When we're upright versus being slouched, not only does one feel more confident, but you're perceived by others as being more confident. One's physical attitude is conveyed by the position we hold. Additionally, posture has a role in what's labeled embodied emotional theory. This theory posits that mental events are represented by the state of our body posture. So an, individual's, an individual conveys a greater sense of pride when their physical position and behavior was more upright and stable and secure. This has been extended actually into embodied cognition um, where there's a complex interplay described between the body, the brain, and the environment. The literature shows that children with autism in particular are less able to access the social representations of interactions due to their impairments in sensory integration. Thus, children with autism have reduced access to this embodied knowledge of social cues and is evidenced by their lack or reduced use of bodily gestures and facial imitation. So what does it all mean? Well, motor symptoms or impairments are also commonly observed in children with a multitude of clinical diagnoses, including autism. Um, and clearly posture and movement should be part of a comprehensive clinical assessment. Posture is an area that can be targeted early um, with the potential to impact functioning across multiple motor dimensions, um, as well as potentially across social and communication dimensions. It's unlikely that there's one single posture or motor factor that will emerge as a predictor of a later autism diagnosis. But one thing that we do know is that it's a very complex area. And hopefully what we'll see in the future is maybe more of a cluster of sensory motor signs that may arise as early markers. Um, but importantly, supporting postural control and motor performance should be considered not just in assessment, but also as indicated as part of a comprehensive treatment program. So this is where we can expand our thoughts, maybe today in some of our some comments or questions that people might have. Um, but we don't want to teach social skills and communication in isolation, right? We want to address, address balance and posture as part of participation in daily life activities um, and consider the nature of the task and the environment's impact on that performance and participation. We want to address 
motor skills um, as they occur naturally with opportunities for social and communication practice. This may or may not occur within naturalistic settings, but what we do know is that better motor skills are associated with better communication and better social interaction, which clearly has to inform our intervention processes. So there are, of course, lots of remaining questions, one of which do motor deficits qualify as a core feature of autism? Are these sensory motor impairments a causative factor um, in the development of social and communication skill, or at least a significant contributing factor? And if balance deficits are associated with age, are adolescents and adults also at risk for postural instability concerns that can interfere with participation in daily life? So clearly this is where the research is going to um, expand. So as Gibson said many years ago, we must perceive in order to move, but we must also move in order to perceive. Each new motor accomplishment further expands our experience and thereby creates strong links among motor development, cognition, and social development. And that's it. <laughs> All right, very nice, Sarah. There are a number of questions that came up in the chat. So I don't know, Marco, if you wanna to start those off. Yeah, I'm I'm actually going to start for the with the questions that we have on the key QA. And if people have more questions, maybe you can use that channel because it's easier to to sort the questions. Um, Sarah, one one question that uh, came out in this QA was uh, about the relation uh, of post control with feeding difficulties. Would you I'm mind sorry. to I missed the first word you said, the relation between what? Postural control, oh, okay. posture, and feeding difficulties. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about, about that? Um, well, I think that it's, it's huge. Um, we know that a lot of kids um, fatigue um, when they're sitting in an upright posture, um, and that the posture that you maintain while you're eating um, really impacts the, the oral mechanism. For example, when you're slouched over and you hyperextend your neck, you're, it pulls your jaw open um, and it makes it really difficult to swallow. And so we know that there, there are these subtle adjustments in the head and the neck and the shoulders that allow us to um, maximize the pressure that we use for chewing um, as well as the mechanisms, um, as I said, for swallowing. So, um, but I do want to add that um, one of the things about working with kids who have postural control that I've noticed over the years is that um, we have to be respectful of their low endurance um, and that um, for function, um, where eating is going to be a primary activity, you may need to use some adjust uh, external supports um, or give the child breaks um, because the primary function is to get the nutrition um, in, in them as well. So we don't want to compromise their feeding abilities um, for the, the food intake that they uh, need. That's such a good point. Um, do you see now thinking about that respect for their in endurance when we, we're treating kids with posture difficulties, we, we, we bring a lot of motor uh, you know, demands and opportunities. And is that something that you also think about when, when treating posture difficulties with the kids' endurance and they might actually fatigue uh, a lot more? Um, and how do you balance that in your in your treatment session? 
Yeah, that's that's a really good point um, because I think everybody sort of wonders if a child claims fatigue um, that are they trying to get out of a challenging activity. Um, I think that um, we have to be respectful of that fatigue um, and to recognize the thresholds that the kids have, um, because I, I guarantee you, they want to continue playing with their occupational therapist because that's just their highlight, right, of their week or of their day. Um, and, um, and of course, what they're doing is highly motivating. Um, so um, I, I usually build in and would build in some breaks in the, the intervention, um, the therapy session so that um, that, that in complete fatigue or uh, uh, you know, loss of energy doesn't, doesn't happen, but it allows to persist. And it can be actually very easily integrated in any kind of pretend play theme. Um, I remember one kiddo that I was working with, she always had like, there was always a, um, a sleep scenario. So she was always, the, the play theme always included, well, we're going to go to sleep and then, you know, mommy or daddy's going to come and wake us. So it sort of allowed her to regroup mm -hmm. to be able to participate fully in, in the session. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of one of the ways we often take breaks with the kids is to have that sensory play that has no motor demands in, in betwixt and between those other effortful kind of activities where they're really using, you know, doing a lot of heavy work and challenging their strength and, and stamina. Um, so when they, you know, get to swing the lycra swing or you know, have go in the ball pool for a little while, that those are sort of natural breaks in the motor demands. Yeah, good point. All right, moving on to another question, and this is uh, related to definitions or nomenclature. Uh, is balance and postural control, uh, are they used interchangeably? Uh, or what's the difference between the two concepts? That's a really good question. And, and this, this area is filled with a lot of different terms um, and different people use different terms as well. Um, my understanding, and so I've just prefaced that based on what I've read, is that postural control is sort of the umbrella term. Balance is one component of postural control um, because um, as we were saying, I think in like the first couple of slides, when we think about postural control, we think about not just the balance component, but the postural tone, the postural alignment that supports the postural control that allows the balance to emerge. So I see it as a component of this broader uh, domain. Thank you. Okay, another question. Um, there's this question about what kind of postural abnormality or issues that are often shown by autistic children? Um, and in, you know, following that, um, Liz is asking if you could share some research that uh, really talks about improvement or shows improvement in postural control through sensory integration intervention with autistic children. <laughs> um, well, I think I'll let Zoe, comment on the <laughs> effectiveness research um, related to to intervention. Um, but I think that that the range of deficits that could be present um, are quite varied. And they're clearly what what I was reading a, the most about were these balance issues. But there's also the lack of synchrony, then the activation of muscles around mm -hmm. um, the joints for stability. There's the endurance issues. There is um, asymmetries that are present. Um, so I think that there are a lot of different ways that the um, postural mechanisms are impacted um, and are seen in also the, the motor skill area. Um, but Zoe, I don't know if you want to follow up. Well, I think I would just say that, you know, most of the... Um efficacy research has really focused on distal outcomes, more participation related 
uh, functions, but I think that looking at postural control and some of the other mechanisms related to it would be really important proximal outcomes that we could be considering. And balance and postural control are probably fairly stable in comparison to some of the sensory measures. We see more fluctuations in the sensory measures. So those would probably be some good hypotheses to look at how things like feeding and dressing might be negatively impacted when postural control is not optimal. And those would be really logical measures to start including. Clinicians can start doing that in their regular practice. You know, we don't have to wait for large RCT studies for that to happen. I think clinicians can make those hypotheses and start testing it out when they see a change in postural control and they see a change in balance and other related functions, ocular control. Do they see in concert with that better participation in those functions we know are dependent? While I'm talking, I just, I loved that last slide, Sarah, that, um, and I wondered if that's the title of your next paper, do motor <laughs> Uh, could you do you know exactly what it said? Because it was just perfect. It would be a perfect I can bring paper. It up again. Yeah, do do motor motor deficits <laughs> qualify? As yes, a, that's it. <laughs> as a core feature of autism. One, one more bag, Suzanne. <laughs> do motor deficits qualify as a core? Oops, nope. Go ahead. As a feature I of think autism. That's it, right? Yep, that's mm -hmm. it. So how's that paper coming? I think we need it. <laughs> you know, and I do keep thinking this is probably going to be on the agenda for our next meeting, but you know, two, 2013 was the last DSM. That's 10 years ago. So it must there must be a committee working on looking at the criteria for diagnosis of autism, you know, coming up again. We're 10 years in with the current DSM. And it was great that sensory hyper and hyporeactivity were added, but what about these other features that we know are so prevalent? So I'm yeah, no, I think that, that for is, you, Sarah. Uh, that's going to be a good paper that you're going to lead. Okay, I, I, I appreciate the encouragement. Um, <laughs> I do think that um, that what what you were saying is really important about how clinicians can really you. Um, use some objective measures of of balance um uh that um you know as pre and post their intervention you know we do standing balance activities um you know as an assessment you know, there's no reason why you can't test you know one foot standing eyes open eyes closed before and after um your intervention um and the other thing that i feel like really is is necessary at this point is considering that whole area of gestures and the role of gestures in nonverbal communication and how they're so dependent on posture and motor coordination um, and to what extent we can measure those um, and use that as a reflection of the effectiveness of our intervention because it's so foundational to communication. And, you know, yeah. in our, our study on autism, we saw a lot of um, depressed post rotary nystagmus or vestibular nystagmus. And so we, in fact, and in fact, standing and walking balance was the lowest mean score among all of the SIPT measures in, in the group cohort. And so, you know, that's, that's a really significant area of need in autism. And, and if I just jump over to school-based practice right now, um, you know, right now, I, I think it's such a huge, huge concern um, that so many children are being asked to sit still, hold still, sit still and do your handwriting, do your visual motor, do your do your task at your desk. And, you know, um, meeting after meeting, the teachers, oh, well, you know, he's busy, but it's just behavior. It's a, just attention or, well, we just redirect. And then you do the tests and you see that they have these sensory motor challenges that aren't well understood. Um, and I think there's a little more acknowledgement of the gross motor skill development, those, those more active and dynamic postural um, responses versus the static postural responses. I think people aren't, aren't measuring it. They don't understand it, that it's really just difficult for these kids to sit still, hold still, put their little 
moving bodies in a chair and keep them there. And then they're getting in trouble. And so I think that that's a very relevant outcome because if they can't keep their body in the chair, then they're not going to be getting their eyes on their work. And then they're not going to be able to control their hands while their bodies are moving around to get their handwriting and their visual motor tests done. Yeah, so true. And also, if people just even just understanding that postural control is foundational to this these motor development, and that they're, they're these the static and dynamic systems have to function both independently as well as as together. Yeah, and there is a yeah. question in the chat about um, children's furniture, and that's yeah. and that's another big you know, a uh, concern I have when you go in and the little, you know, they're, they're not, you know, they have a goal for sitting still in their chair for 20 minutes or whatever. And then they've got an adult sized chair for a tiny little body and their feet are dangling and they don't have adequate supports on their chairs. Or you see a child who has very poor stability. They need more support in a chair and they're trying to sit on a bench. And, and then again, they, they end up in trouble. So yeah. just that children's furniture is, is a concern that it fits them, that that it's adjusted to them, that their table's the right size. I even saw a child sitting on a on a chair and his chin was on the table while he was <laughs> doing his work. Oh. It was like, how's that working for him? <laughs> and that they move, that they get some movement in their chairs. Yep. Um yeah. I I really, I think, I just want to add a comment about it and link it to a question that we have on the Q and A uh, about the, you know, this be part of the, the the criteria or the characteristics of autism. And when we think about eye contact, right, and and the need that it, how that is embedded on posture and good posture. And I had so many kids that when you actually come down to a level where they don't have to sustain that posture, their eye contact just got so much better, right, with with that. Um, and so someone's asking about uh, if you could highlight the impact that posture or poor posture has on behavior issues with ASD. Um, could, could, do you see a relationship there in somehow? Well, I think one of the most um, fascinating um, findings that um, actually uh, that I recently came upon for this lecture was um, was about anxiety um, and how the relation between anxiety mechanisms that underlie anxiety and those that underlie um, you know postural control, um, which was sort of uh, which I need to investigate further because I don't know enough about it. But um, I do think that um, that the the interconnections between um, our emotional response to the demands of the environment, our postural control and, um, and the be behavior is, is very complex because, and the social, social interaction piece, the, the, the um, keeping up with one's peers is a, a huge big deal, right? Of, of kids, you know, and, having a weaker motor system with maybe underlying postural issues means that that child is is facing challenges every day of their life right that they're going to school potentially not keeping up so what do you do in response to that well you some kids act silly and they you know try to avoid it some kids withdraw some kids may become more aggressive that you use what your body can do um, to the best of your ability. I mean, it's it, it's it's it. I, I really believe that those connections exist. Kids aren't just acting out to right to be bad. They really are struggling because they know on some level that their systems aren't equipped to handle all of these um, encounters, whether it's with peers or in the in the classroom or during recess or you know any time during the day um so mm -hmm. i think that i'm not sure how i i might have gone beyond the question but that's sort of how i see that them all in in um interrelated 
You know, related to that, Sarah, Eris said that our first relationship is with gravity. Gravity. I know. I and love that know, quote too. <laughs> that's my favorite. That's amazing. A lot about, you know, the importance of mastering that relationship just to move on uh, with your own body and with other people and the world around you. Yeah. And in the adult literature, um, any vestibular concern uh, is associated with anxiety. It's considered that anxiety is ubiquitous with vestibular concerns. It's so primally important for you to feel that you can move against gravity, you know, just at a very primal level. And so they don't have, I mean, I don't know that research in children, um, but it's very well accepted in adult literature that that's, you know, concomitant. And, and I think that we see that in autism. Of course, there, there's very likely other issues related to anxiety more than just vestibular, just like there's more sensory con contributors to posture than just vestibular. But I think it's a, a, a vastly overlooked system um, that, of course, we're, we're shining a light on all the time. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Go ahead. I'll, Can we do I'll it? ask Sarah privately my question. Oh, I'll, okay. So I'll have access two more. To, so two more. Ahead. This go one ahead. and one more. This mm -hmm. one and yours, Zoe. Um, so this one is really about if you if you have any resources or you know some tips on how to explain. I I think this webinar is a great resource to to give to parents and other professionals how to explain this link between posture you know things that people for, for granted and this important uh all this important things that we were just talking here do you have any go-tos um you know i mean i use the research you know because i feel like people it 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 complements, I won't say it replaces your clinical wisdom, but it definitely complements what, um, you know, what is being identified in larger samples of, of children to, to show that this postural system is linked to so many other functions. Um, and then of course, you know, the observations of their, of their child um, and and what and how the postural system might be impacting that individual, I think, is you know the example that's probably going to be most meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, we see kids who you know by a half hour after being in school, their head is on the table because of the mm -hmm. you know they're fatigued already in that endurance, or you know trying to explain how important motor coordination and motor skills are in terms of playing with your peers, you know, out on the playground and those kinds of things that um, I think, you know, the more they can relate to the examples relative to their own child's um, challenges, I think the more meaningful, but there are definitely families also who want, show me the data, what does the research say so that um, I understand, that they can understand um, the, um, that this is not just your opinion, but is being right. supported by evidence. Um, thank you. Did you want to make your question? Yeah, yeah well, it's okay. We're, we need to go on <laughs> to our contest, but I just think you've done, I just want to say you've done a great job, Sarah. This was a, such a thoughtful presentation. And I think you've just shed a lot of light on the importance of looking behind the behavior and looking behind the assumptions. Um, you've given a lot of food for thought of ways to, to shift that lens that instead of thinking this is a child who doesn't care, isn't trying to really be, you know, show that respect. That was a really beautiful way to put it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And I, I love your focus beyond motor control, moving into the, the whole fundamental foundation for social emotional development and a sense of competence in, you know, being an active being in our world. So thank you so much for your You're presentation. Welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Uh, we love it. Okay, so I'm going to share my PowerPoint one last time. Um, let me make sure I've got and the right. We thing still have that. gifts to give. I love that. Part. That is it. That's what we have to do right here. 
We have one more webinar. Um, it's November 21st. Dr. Roseanne Schaff has um, said she's going to join us talking about something with research. And then um, don't forget our classy program. You can always sign up. And then the winner. Okay. So All right. The moment we've and been we, waiting for. All right. So we have two winners. One is his, uh, is a kit, easy starter kit uh, winner. And that name is, and I hope I don't mess it up, Wendy Sawicki. Congratulations, Wendy. You just won an easy starter kit. And then our South Park gift card winner is Marid Abbas. Congratulations to both of you, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. All right. Thank you, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Stay safe. Stay well. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you so you. much. I will thank see you, you in a few you weeks. Soon. <laughs> yes, <and laughs> thank, you. thank you to Marco and the Classy team for making this possible, and Suzanne, as always, you just put together a beautiful program. So thank you all. Yes, thank, thank you, everybody, you. for coming. Good, good night or good day, wherever you're off. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever time, Bye. so. Bye-bye. <laughs>